Welcome to Old Brump's Garage. Hey y'all, on this episode, we're gonna discuss cooling your square body. I've been watching a lot of video and seeing a lot of Instagram messages and whatnot, and I understand that there was a lot of folks on Hot Rod Power Tour this year having cooling problems. And it kind of rung a bell with me and said, hey, we probably need to make sure that we've addressed the cooling system on Hutch, our 1986 square body. If you recall from earlier episodes, this truck, according to this sticker here, was originally, uh, originally equipped with a 4.3 liter V6. It's been in the high 90s, bordering around 100, 101 some days here in South Georgia. And a couple short drives I've noticed, uh, if I get stopped in traffic, the temperature kind of creeps up in the 210 range, which being the truck doesn't have air conditioning on it yet, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. So uh, did a little looking and I'm gonna show you a couple things that I've noticed. So if you look here, you'll see there is a, a space with a hole in it, which is for the uh, rubber mount that sits on the bottom of a radiator. And if you look on the other side, You'll see one over there too. What that indicates to me is, whenever the engine swap was done and the V8 was put in this truck, the radiator was not upgraded. This is still the small stock radiator that came for a 4.3 liter V6. So what I'm seeing is, before we've even bothered putting air conditioning on this truck, we're really pushing the coolant system's limit with this particular radiator for a V8. As you go up in engine size, you need to be carefully considering your cooling system. And I believe that this current configuration is on the upper limits of what this cooling system can manage and probably over it. So what I've done is I've ordered a, a new shroud because this shroud's smaller for the V6 radiator, and I've ordered a new aluminum three-row radiator that is the dimensions of what this truck would have had if it had to come with the V8 from the factory. So we're going to upgrade that, and we're going to do some monitoring. Because this usually makes such a mess, I've jacked the truck up enough to get a five gallon bucket underneath the spigot on the radiator. And I'm catching the majority of the water. Of course, as you can imagine, I'm not gonna perfectly catch all of it. I'm gonna make a mess and that's what we do at Old Grump's Garage. Looking down on this radiator, I can almost assure you this is the factory unit from 1986 because it's got a rather orange look on the inside. And I'm seeing a lot of green down in here, like it might be leaking between the tank and the fins. Still draining water pretty good. I'll put another bucket under the other side and pull the lower radiator hose. These bottom hoses can be a lot of fun to get off sometimes. <clears throat> Ooh. 
Niagara Falls. Again, most of it's going in the bucket, but I can see water in the floor too. Now mind you, while you're doing this, you're not only draining the radiator, but when you pull that bottom hose, it's gonna drain the water out of the engine block too. So once we replace the radiator and go to fill it back up, be mindful you have drained the heater core and the engine block. So you're gonna to wanna to start the engine up without the radiator cap on, let it get warm, wait for the thermostat to open, and then refill the radiator again because it's gonna it's gonna take about half of what's in the radiator, circulate it through the uh, heater core and the engine block, and if you don't monitor that after you've done it, you will end up with a very low radiator. All right, so the bottom hose is, sounds like it's finished draining. Now I'm gonna take the uh, the line off of the radiator for the heater core. All right, so I've got the upper radiator hose, lower radiator hose, and the heater hose pulled off of the radiator now. Now we need to address our transmission cooler lines. Be very careful with these. I suggest not using an open end wrench, but a flare nut wrench so that you don't round these off. Because if you round them off, you're gonna be in a world of hurt. And nobody likes being in a world of hurt. You may ask yourself, how did I get here? You may ask yourself, this is not my big car. You may ask yourself, what's a flare nut wrench? This is a flare nut wrench. You'll notice it's got a few more sides to it than the regular end wrench. And that's what we want to use. It's got a little slot that just will go over the tubing and then it grabs a whole bunch of sides on that fitting so that we don't round it off. And I can tell by looking at the fitting, somebody else has used a flat wrench on it because it has had some damage done to it in the past. Thankfully, we can get a flare nut wrench on it now and not create any more damage to that nut so that we don't have to replace it. Again, after you do this, you're gonna get the truck hot and go through topping off the radiator. And then you're gonna check that transmission fluid and make sure it's topped off because this radiator is circulating transmission fluid through the radiator cooler that's built in the radiator. And so by swapping it out, you're losing some of that. I wouldn't think that it's a whole quart, but you still need to check it and make sure with the transmission hot in idle that you check that fluid level and keep it topped off. Okay, so the transmission lines are loose, thanks to our friend, the flare nut wrench. Because it's an 86, we get to play 
guess the size of the bolt holding on the fan shroud and is it metric or is it standard because this truck 85s and 86s are the years that you find both metric and standard bolts scattered across the vehicle for no rhyme or reason. I'm guessing because General Motors was trying to use up the inventory they had so they weren't putting metric bolts out until all the standards were used. So several thousand vehicles are a little combination of both. First thing I'm noticing is it doesn't look like there's a cushion between the top of this radiator and the fan shroud. There would have been, but who knows what's happened in the past, right? This fan shroud is a two-piece, so fortunately for us, we don't have to take the fan off to get it off. You can simply unbolt the top of the fan shroud. And then pull the top off. And I'm correct. So folks, if you'll look right here, there should be a rubber insert here. It's got a little uh, tit on it that goes through this hole that holds it in place. And then it sits on the shoulder of the radiator, which would be that shoulder right there. And that hole holds and insulates the radiator from vibration and holds it in place. Those are missing on this truck. So we will need to acquire a set of those before we finish this job. We can now lift the radiator out carefully since he's still got water in him and we can carry him out and finish emptying him, trying not to get it all over the floor. Any worse than we already have, I should say. And what's coming out of the radiator has some water, some antifreeze, and some brown silt to it. So chances are the radiator may have been partially plugged on top of everything else. But I do see signs down both sides of it. Bring this back in and put it on camera so you can see. So you can see these green streaks both inside and outside the tank. There's also green streaks over here on this side. That indicates leakage because it's a copper and brass radiator when water and other liquids sit on it for a while they begin to color it green and I see green down in the core. I see green down the side of this tank. Um, like I said as we were draining it I had Clear water with a little hint of green to it, as if there wasn't much antifreeze. And then as we got to the bottom, we started getting a rusty orange uh, thickness, which tells me there's probably some, uh, probably some blockage in that radiator. So the bottom of the radiator had the rubber pieces I was telling you about, and for reference, there's one. So this radiator should be sitting on four of those, um, two on the bottom, two on the top. And as I was discussing earlier how I had realized that this had the smaller radiator in it, as you see where the shroud is sitting right there, there are two holes for the V6 shroud, but over here, there's a place for the wider V8 radiator and its shroud. And that's how I realized right off that this still had the 
the uh, narrower and thin V6 radiator. So that's what we're addressing next is taking the small shroud out and getting things ready for the proper radiator. And we are really hopeful that improves temperature on the truck in these high heat conditions. Because I really don't want to go on power tour and be one of the guys sitting on the side of the road with the hood up being miserable. And we know we've got air conditioning ordered, so we know that we're going to be putting air conditioning into this, and that puts a little bit more strain on the vehicle's cooling system. And uh, we definitely want the cooling system to be top notch, and we want to be cool riding down the road in 100 degree weather. So old fan shreds out, new fan shreds ready to go in. If you're, uh, if you're building a truck with a 4.3 V6 and you, uh, you need a fan shroud, just give us a call. Be, uh, be happy to help you out. Punch this please. Even. So the new fan shroud, it's not bolt together, but uh, Let's just see if, looks like it'll ease down there before the radiators hit it. And by Jovi, that appears to be the right shroud. So that's comforting. Everything lines up up here. So, <clears throat> That's good news. So if we're really fortunate, we can wiggle the new radiator in there and then get the shroud to go back in place. Lots of chances. So you, you always want these rubber cushions in place no matter what kind of radiator you have, but, and definitely with an aluminum radiator, you need to be very mindful these things are in place because you don't want an aluminum radiator rubbing against the metal tray of the frame that holds the radiator in place because it will wear a hole in it rather quickly. And that would be upsetting after spending hundreds of dollars on a new radiator. Alrighty. And take it, you two don't like each other. And I'd be correct. All right. So what we're learning today is the stock 
radiator shroud is not compatible with the new aluminum radiator. Which means one thing. It means we're going to need to convert this rascal to electric fans and buy the electric fan and shroud package that goes with this radiator. Alrighty y'all, we uh, have had several discoveries in converting the 86 C10 square body from the original V6 radiator that was in the truck. Um, just to catch you up, a prior owner had converted this truck to a V8, but the, we discovered the V6 radiator was still in it. So we bought, uh, we had two options on radiators. We could buy a copper and brass uh, V8 radiator for this truck that ran upwards of around 680 to 750 bucks. Or we could go aluminum, same size three row uh, for about half of that. So we went with the aluminum thinking that we could use the factory V8 fan shroud and brackets and the mechanical fan uh, to stay in budget and be economical. We discovered once we got the radiator in that the fan shroud and mechanical fan weren't going to work. So we abandoned that, bought the shroud that Champion makes for their radiator that just snaps on, and the electric fans. So we still got to do some electrical for the fan controls and for the sensor that goes into the uh, water on the intake manifold to turn the fans on and off. Uh, we had some issues with the upper brackets for the stock brackets. Didn't quite grab the radiator and hold it as tight as we wanted to. The factory rubber mounts didn't quite work out, so we had to modify them a little bit, add some more uh, rubber stripping in there to get the radiator good and firm where it doesn't move around. So, been a little bit of adventure, but I feel like we're going to be in a really good state when we get this finished. Uh, so we still got the electrical to do for the fans, fill her back up with water, and we'll be ready for a test drive. We interrupt this program to ask you to take a moment and like the video, and go ahead and subscribe to the channel. It'll really help us maintain the channel and continue to provide you content that you find interesting to help you along your way as you're restoring square bodies and other old Chevrolet pickup trucks, and it continues to grow our community. Thank you for your support, and we now return you to your regularly scheduled program. All right, y'all, got her all back together. We have uh, mounted the electric fans. We've got them wired in. We've got the harness running back over and down. Got a power wire running between the radiator and the fan shroud. If I loosen this up and roll forward, you can see the wire running between the fan shroud and the radiator over towards the battery. And if we walk around here, you can see the relays are mounted to the inner fender right there uh, nearest the radiator as per the instructions. And you got one switched uh, ignition wire going back to the fuse block in the truck. Uh, the one little last caveat for the fight to finish this, thermostat housing. So thermostat housing had a, a threaded port that we could have put the uh, thermostat uh, controller in for the electric fans, but somebody had put a steel nut in it, and if you don't put anesthes in there, um, because that's two different metals, it will seize. So I tried with everything I had, including a four foot pipe wrench with about four foot of cheater pipe, and I was rocking the truck, but the pipe plug was not about to remove. So instead of fighting the fight any harder, I purchased a replacement 
thermostat housing and swapped it out. So you can see right here is the thermostatic switch that came with the fan wiring kit. The, uh, I filled the radiator, let the truck idle until it got up and warm. The thermostat opened, the level of antifreeze in the radiator dropped. I filled it back up, put the cap on, let it sit here a little bit longer. Uh, when it reached 195 degrees, the fan kicked on and it quickly dropped back down in the 190 range and sit right at 190, 189. And every time it got to 195, the fan would come on and it'd go right back down lickety split. Uh, I'll be listing all the parts that were involved in this project for you uh, best I can. Radiator, fan shroud, fans, wiring harness. Uh, if I can remember um, the thermostat housing. And one other thing I want to talk about before we let you go, and that would be radiator caps. Something most folks probably don't talk much about, but a radiator cap can be a very dangerous thing. If you're driving somewhere and the vehicle gets hot, and you're wanting to add water and you're contemplating taking the radiator cap off. A normal radiator cap is a real good way to get yourself burned if you don't let the vehicle cool all the way down. The reason for that is a regular radiator cap, um, you have to push it all the way down to get it to release its lock mechanism. I'm sure you've put one on, you know what I'm talking about. The unfortunate part is when you do that, if, if it's hot and it's still under pressure, you release that lock, the pressure builds up and you can feel it start to push the cap at you. Now you can't push it back down to lock it when you've made the mistake of trying to take it off and it's too hot and under pressure. So at this point, you're pushing down on the cap but you can't get it locked back and you finally realize the trouble you're in. So you put your hand on the cap and you turn your back to the vehicle and you try to run and what happens? The radiator cap comes off, the contents of the radiator now explodes and hits you somewhere about your hairline and you have second degree burns from your hairline down to your waistline where it stops going because you got a belt on and it's holding the water there. How do I know? I've seen it happen. I've seen the results of somebody that's had that happen. And so the solution, a lever vent safety cap. What's this do? The red lever here releases the pressure without unlocking or twisting the cap off. By doing that, you release it. If it's under pressure, you'll hear fluid start going through this overflow tube and actually boiling sounds will appear in your overflow tank over here. All you have to do is just push the vent uh, lock back down without taking the cap off. So you push the lever back down, everybody's good. At this point, you've never taken the cap off and you haven't taken the chance of getting yourself burnt. Everybody's vehicle comes to the factory with a standard old radiator cap. When you buy a brand new radiator, it comes with a standard old radiator cap. Every vehicle I purchase, I swap them out for a lever safety cap just because I've seen the results of somebody having that kind of accident and I'm not interested in repeating it. So look into it. Uh, Stamp makes a really good one. That's what this one is here. And uh, I think they're a good investment, just a few dollars and you eliminate the opportunity of something really bad happening. So really happy with this. The uh, wiring harness that I used uh, is uh, a pretty good one. It's got three relays on it. So it has a relay for the first fan, which it calls low, it has a relay for a second fan. So if it doesn't start cooling off and the temperature rises more with the first fan running, it'll kick the second fan on. And the third relay is if you have AC on the vehicle, you can hook it into that third relay. And the minute you engage the clutch on your air conditioning compressor by turning the air conditioning on, it will turn a fan on. I think it's a really good investment. That uh, wiring harness came from Painless and very simple to install, very precise and uh, good instructions with good labeling on it. And I think it was a good investment as well. Y'all have a great day.